how do you see the prospect for reviving the Sri Lanka's tourism sector during the COVID era? And is it realistic to conduct mass tourism under biosecure conditions? That is one question. But I have a slightly more general question for you. I, I'll be posing the question to you. And that is, you know, you the sector has had to um, confront a number of major crises, right? You, you had the MFA finishing, you had GSP plus uh, going away for some time. And each time you have been able to kind of overcome these, these issues. Uh, um, and, you know, the bombings, a whole series of issues. And really, what are the prospects now of coming to grips with this problem, which arguably may be greater than anything that you've had? So how, how are you all, you know, preparing, um, proposing to overcome that? That's one question. The second is how we should position Sri Lanka as a destination in the post-COVID world. So those are the two kind of broad questions, yeah? Amira, you tell us when we should go, please. We have one more minute, so I can go live now. And if you start in about approximately a minute, Dr. Kum, it takes about a minute. There's a lag time, about mm. a minute. So I'll go live now. Um, gentlemen, if you can keep your mic switched off, keep the videos on, keep the mic switched off, and then switch it on when it comes, when you want to make a comment. So, Dr. Kum, you can start in a minute, okay? Okay. Okay. Okay, good afternoon to all of you um, in Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you very much for participating in this webinar. As you know, the theme for today's session is a business perspective on economic transformation, which we hope will be very timely as Sri Lanka is in the process of positioning its economy uh, to succeed in the post pandemic world. The webinar is organized jointly by the Pathfinder Foundation and the Centennial Group. The Pathfinder Foundation is an independent nonpartisan think tank. Uh, it focuses on advocacy on economic reform, as well as exploring ideas as to how Sri Lanka, can, Sri Lanka can navigate its strategic and security issues. It was founded by uh, ex cabinet minister and high commissioner designate to Delhi, Mr. Mirinda Morogode, and the chairman is ambassador Bernard Gunatilaka, who was formerly foreign secretary and who held ambassadorial position in key capitals around the world, in China, India, the US, and also was permanent representative to the UN in both New York and, and Geneva. Now, uh, our co-moderator today is Mr. Rajat Nag, um, and he will, uh, when he makes his remarks after me, uh, will talk to you a little bit about the Centennial Group to introduce it to you. So let me uh, now at the outset, uh, get the introductions out of the way. We've got a very impressive lineup of uh, uh, speakers and panelists. Um, the first, Mr. Nag, 
Mr. Rajat Nag uh, was the managing director general of the ADB from 2006 to 2013. He held several other top positions in the ADB and is very well known and respected internationally for both his knowledge of the whole spectrum of development issues and also extensive, his extensive operational experience. Uh, Mr. Nag's expertise and experience have been enriched by the fact that he worked at the ADB during a period when Asia was the most dynamic region in the world. So he is well placed to share with us uh, the kind of what has worked and what has not worked so well in terms of transformation uh, in the whole of the Asian region. And so we are very grateful to Mr. Nag for participating and co-moderating uh, this session. The lead presentation will be made by Dr. Ganesh and Vignaraja, who I'm sure is known to all of you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Vignaraja is an outstanding economist who had his tertiary education first at the LSE and then his doctoral studies uh, were conducted at Oxford. Uh, he has worked for the ADB, the Commonwealth Secretariat, and the leading consultancy firm Maxwell's Time. He was also executive director of the Lakshman Kadirgama Institute. Uh, Ganeshan has an extremely impressive track record of research, and he continues to maintain links with a number of international thought centers as well, including the Overseas Development Institute in London and leading think tanks in the South Asian region. Um, while at the ADB, he was head of research at its institute in Tokyo. Now, given the theme of the webinar, we are fortunate in having leading figures from three firms representing three subsectors which have demonstrated a capacity for transformation, namely the apparel subsector, tourism, and ICT. In addition, we have the doyen of the financial journalists in the country, a uh, very well known a name which I will come to in a minute. So um, the three panelists, the four panelists, if I may quickly run through them. First, on the apparel sector, we have Mr. Hasita Premaratna, who is group finance director of the Brandix Group. He's also MD of the Brandix India Apparel City. Um, I don't need to introduce the Brandix Group to you. It is an iconic firm, which has contributed massively in terms of export earnings and employment in the country. And it has also been able to transform itself into a high-end manufacturer. Uh, um, and, in, in, and in the process of doing so, domestic value addition is almost double. Uh, plus, they have been able uh, to become a truly global third world MNC. So it, he's very well placed to share with us some of the drivers of the successful transformation that Brandix has been able to achieve, uh, being a very senior member of their management team. Uh, then, uh, second panelist uh, on, in terms of the speaking order is Jeevan Yanam. Jeevan belongs to the third generation of one of the leading families of entrepreneurs in the country. He is the CEO of Orion City, a leading provider of ICP facilities. And he also um, is the co founder of a number of forward looking enterprises in the IT star startup uh, space. These include the Lanka Angel Network, SACS, Crowd Island, Hatch. Uh, veracity of um, AI and digital reality. Uh, so, um, um, Jeevan will be sharing with us uh, the experience of arguably the most dynamic subsector in the economy at the moment, certainly in terms of uh, growth in export earnings, the IT sector has been doing extremely well. Then for the tourism, sec tourism sector, we have Hiran Kure, who is extremely well known who has been a leading figure in the tourism sector for many years now. He's the chairman of the Jetwing Symphony PLC, uh, and he is also currently chairman of the Sri Lanka Tourism Advisory Council. Now, Iran is one of the leaders uh, in the, in the um, travel and tourism sector, and he has great experience of steering one of the leading companies in this sector through the trials and tribulations that the sector has been confronted with totally beyond their control over now several decades. And he also has an important input into policy uh, through his current role as chair of the uh, Tourism Advisory Council. And finally, um, of course, I don't need to uh, introduce Nista. Uh, he's a household name in the field of Sri Lankan journalism. Um, he is, as I said, the doyen of the financial journalists in this country. And Nista has had a very close up view of 
good things and bad things that have happened in the economy. And he has very high level contacts in not only in business, but also in government uh, and, 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 and amongst uh, the politicians. So he is very well placed to distill some valuable insights as to uh, what, uh, what is relevant to this theme. And I hope we can tap into his knowledge. And now if I may just make a few introductory remarks on the theme, um, you know, at the time of independence, Sri Lanka was second to Japan on most socioeconomic indicators. Since that time, we've done pretty well in terms of social development. And the recent uh, rankings on the UNDP Human Development Index uh, validate that. However, for a country which was ahead of both South Korea and Singapore, as late as the mid 60s, we have now fallen well behind a number of other Asian countries as far as economic transformation is concerned. What are the causal factors? Arguably the most significant one is macroeconomic stress. It's been a major causal factor. And the government poor fiscal performance over several decades has been the main source of macroeconomic instability. Now, a sustained decline in revenue at the percent of GDP and poor export performance has made Sri Lanka a twin deficit country. That is a persistent deficit in the budget, a persistent deficit in the current account of the balance of payments. And a twin deficit country is amongst the most vulnerable category of countries uh, in the world. Now, in such a context, businesses have had to operate where they have been cons constantly um, constrained by inconsistent and unpredictable stop-go policies. As countries have had to adjust to a lack of revenue, have had to adjust to problems on the balance of payments, the governments have had to make constant adjustments to policies, uh, which obviously makes uh, medium to long-term planning for businesses extremely difficult and makes transformation of businesses and sectors and the economy as a whole more challenging. And at the same time, governments have found it difficult to implement the structural reforms which would improve the business climate in a manner that would facilitate economic transformation. Despite all this, there have been some success, successes. And the three sectors that we are going to hear from today have been notable for the successes they have achieved, despite the difficult circumstances that they have been confronted with. And we are fortunate in having very senior people from the companies in these sectors to share their insights with us. So with that, let me uh, hand over to uh, Dr. Rajat Nag uh, to make his introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kumaraswamy. Uh, thanks very much to Pathfinder, to Amira and her team for inviting me to join this. And right at the outset, though I've been given the distinct honor of co-moderating this with Dr. Kumaraswamy, I'm going to be here much more to learn than to add anything. And I look forward to this discussion, not only Dr. Kumaraswamy, but of course, uh, Dr. Vinirajan, and of course, the very eminent panelists that uh, Dr. Kumaraswamy has already introduced. Uh, I, uh, as uh, Dr. Kumar Swami noted, I was with the Asian Development Bank for many years. Uh, I've spent a lifetime there. And uh, among my many privileges while I was there was one to visit Sri Lanka often. And that's when I met many of you, including of course, Dr. Kumar Swami. And uh, I want to share some observations very much along the lines that uh, my co-chair has mentioned, but from a perspective of looking in. Uh, and of course, uh, the first thing that struck me always was how blessed the country was in terms of many of its potential, human capital being, of course, one of them. And uh, it had always struck me, as uh, Dr. Kumar Swami had said, has said that it was a bit of a pity that Sri Lanka wasn't doing even better. And I was often reminded of uh, Lee Kuan Yew's uh, ambition uh, when the country became independent in 65 to be one day like Sri Lanka. And it was not just idle flattery from his side. I think there was very well-deserved reasons for, for him and many others to feel that way. Uh, having said that, I also felt 
that my visits to Sri Lanka were always a great pleasure. And the so-called policy dialogues with policymakers such as Dr. Kumarasamy was always a great pleasure, also because they were very honest. Uh, and therefore, some of the challenges that you have mentioned, uh, Indrajit, are spot on. And of course, the country was hit by many challenges, uh, including the one of the internal strife, which now, uh, you know, very fortunately uh, is behind us. And therefore, when Pathfinder suggested this seminar, I was very interested and excited because not only are we talking about a post COVID and the transformation that Sri Lanka will go through, but because of some of the structural issues that I think Sri Lanka has to face. Uh, and of course, we're looking forward very much to Ganesh's presentation on that. And one thing that has always concerned me, not only about Sri Lanka, but of many countries in Asia, is whether we are, we as a region, uh, are getting stuck or risk of getting stuck in the so-called middle income trap. Uh, we have done, we as a region, and of course countries like Sri Lanka has done, I think relatively well, Sri Lanka, particularly on the social indicators, and even the other day in my conversation with Ganesh and Amira and Dr. Kumaraswamy, I was commenting on the fact that staying in India, though of course I stay in India, I live in India, uh, this is home, I of course do always take a regional perspective and Sri Lanka still has a lot that the region can emulate on the social indicator side. But I don't think we can rest on that if the economic transformation, the structural issues that Sri Lanka faces along the lines that you have mentioned, Indraji, are not addressed. And there, I think we will, of course, hear from our eminent panelists on manufacturing potential, IT, uh, tourism, but also, and we'll discuss this later, on the financial sector. I think Sri Lanka has some inherent advantages, which for various reasons of the past, political and geopolitical uh, otherwise uh, have sort of somehow held it back. And so I think that will be something we want to uh, look at. My last point that I want to put on the table, and then of course we'll, we'll talk about it through the next hour and three quarters, is regional cooperation, uh, which for a country like Sri Lanka is always a challenge. The positive is it's size. I know that people say they because it's small, it's a challenge. I personally think that sometimes being small and focused is an advantage and Sri Lanka's locational advantage, size advantage uh, at the cross routes of the ocean routes is a, certainly a very, very major uh, positive uh, which can be exploited. On the other hand, I think the reality is that country like Sri Lanka with two very powerful neighbors and don't, those two are not always on the same page, how does a country like Sri Lanka balance the nuanced balancing, which I think is important. And my own feeling is that if Sri Lanka can steer the shoals and it's not always going to be easy, uh, Sri Lanka probably more than many other countries in the region uh, might escape uh, the middle income trap that uh, I talked about a little while back. And of course, to set this all up, um, I can't think of a better person to uh, give us a presentation, educate us, then my dear colleague, uh, Ganesh, uh, uh, Dr. Kumaraswamy has already introduced him, and I don't want to add to the long list of things that uh, Dr. Vignarajan can be very justifiably proud of, that we are proud of, excepting for one thing, that I have a very distinct privilege of having been his colleague for many years at the ADB. So he and I go back a long way as colleagues, and it's actually a great pleasure that once again, our paths have crossed and converged uh, today, and I'm sure there'll be many more like this. So with that, uh, Ganesh, I invite you to make your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Nag and uh, Indrajit and uh, Pathfinder for this uh, wonderful opportunity um, to kind of make some comments uh, to sort of further set the stage uh, for what will come next, which are the really nice uh, sectoral presentations uh, in this uh, long story of Sri Lanka's economic transformation. 
I just want to kind of talk about four things uh, broadly. Um, one is kind of define this idea of economic transformation because it's, it's often must, uh, maligned, uh, in, particularly in our Sri Lankan context. Uh, second, I'll give you a kind of a sense of uh, where Sri Lanka might be on this economic transformation storyline. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the impact of COVID. And finally, I'll try to say a, a very few things about policy. And I know we'll come back to that in the chat. Um, in doing all of this, I'm going to try to draw on uh, two uh, pieces of research that, that I had been involved in. Uh, the first is a paper that I co-authored for uh, the Overseas Development Institute in London, which I'm affiliated on, assessing transformation in sectors in Sri Lanka, uh, garments, tourism, and IT in the long run. Um, and that is available on the website, uh, the SET website of the Overseas Development Institute. And the second is a ongoing research project also by the ODI that I'm involved in on uh, macroeconomic responses um, to shaping uh, policy and structure in a post-COVID world, uh, which is supported by the IDRC, and I'm, I'm working on a paper for Sri Lanka. So the first point I really want to make is that there are many ways uh, to define uh, this notion of economic transformation, and each of these is quite useful depending on what we're trying to do. Um, it's convenient uh, for us today to kind of follow an inferential line of thinking that sees development as really transformation in the structure of a society and of an economy. And this idea is really rooted in uh, historical studies of modern growth by uh, people like Simon Kuznets writing in the mid 60s, uh, Hollis Chenery and, and Moses Serquin writing in the 80s, and many of their followers, including Danny Roderick and others, who talked about the shift of resources from agriculture to industry as being really the defining feature of uh, transformation. Um, and that this transformation will be associated with rising income per head. Um, and it will reflect things like differences in your resource base and your endowments, uh, human capital, technology, natural resources, um, as well as uh, public policy. Now, this was obviously a very narrow uh, shift they talked about ag to industry. But over time, people recognized that, you know, the services sector was very important and that got uh, put into this notion of transformation. So it was ag to industry as well as services. Um, and then th there was recognition that firms were terribly important in transformation. Uh, and then later when environmental considerations came, to, came in, people talk, talked about green growth, uh, gender was important and many other issues. So this concept is, is broad, but it's about shifts and it's about dynamism. Um, the second kind of key point I want to make, um, Sri Lanka was one of the earliest, in fact, if not the earliest country in South Asia to open up in 1977 to foreign trade and investment. Uh, but in spite of doing this, Sri Lanka did not see a typical Asian style or East Asia style pathway of transformation. Um, and, you know, the advantages of Sri Lanka have been kind of mentioned and you know, we have this strategic location in the middle of the Indian Ocean, uh, and with that have uh, become a, a major transshipment uh, place for India in particular, which doesn't have deep water ports. Um, we have these high levels of human development, which has been mentioned, health and education, as well as literacy um, are there, infant mortality is very low uh, by South Asian standards, and then these unspoiled tourism assets. Now, after opening up in 77, and it's you know coming on towards 50 years, 40, 50 years, so it's been a pretty long innings, um, we shifted away from a dualistic agriculture sector. We had a plantation economy, which was kind of high productivity to some extent, and a subsistence ag economy, and that was what it was. Um, and we moved towards manufacturing garments for export and some sort of services, uh, particularly ports and logistics, um, IT services and tourism, for instance. Um, but the glass really remains half full in the way I see it. Um, unlike East Asian countries like Korea, Taiwan, Singapore in particular, but also the People's Republic of China, uh, Sri Lanka seems to be very much stuck at an intermediate stage of economic transformation. You know, for instance, um, we have seen little diversification away from garments to more complex manufacturing, if you like electronics or automobile production or even spare parts or indeed the whole engineering sector is pretty much absent in Sri Lanka. 
and very few uh, Sri Lankan firms are in global value chains, you know, which is this geographically sophisticated way of produ producing goods across uh, Asia and across other areas. Um, while you know the IT and the tourism sector has expanded and come up, and that's a credit to all the firms there, uh, the economic potential of these sectors uh, remains largely untapped. Um, it's a story in the making rather than uh, something that has kind of arrived. Um, and the real question for us is, is this symptomatic of us falling into a, a middle income trap uh, where a country reaches a certain level of development and they get stuck at that level? In Sri Lanka's case, it's something like under $4,000 per head. Um, and you know we can have experienced difficulties in moving up. Now, part of the story is the civil conflict, which you know, lasted 30 years. Um, another explanation is this external shock associated with the tsunami, which people say held us back. Uh, the 2019 Easter bombings is another. Um, you know, the fact that we got a lot of foreign aid in the early stages, some people talk about aid-induced Dutch disease being yet another. This money went from the Mahaveli project and that changed the exchange rate. So there are various explanations that have been offered in this. But I think um, that's not really the whole story, the way I've tried to look at this. Um, I think a lot of it lies in what Dr. Kumarasamy alluded to earlier, which was uh, gaps in effectively managing our open economy policy, or if you like, the outward oriented strategy. And that includes the macro uh, to leverage these advantages, which we were blessed with. And this has been a major issue um, in holding back our transformation. Uh, the third point I want to make is about COVID and what that means. Uh, now, to complicate matters in this kind of glass half filled transformation, COVID induced a sudden stop uh, in not only the growth process in Sri Lanka, but also economic transformation in the rest of South Asia. Um, you know, now that said, of course, uh, the recent approval vaccines um, and several of these um, could bring some signs of light at the end of this uh, very dark uh, COVID tunnel uh, in South Asia, including Sri Lanka. Uh, but of course, the rollout of vaccines will take time. There are infrastructure issues and so on. Now, reflecting kind of this sense of slight optimism, uh, the IMF World Economic Outlook of October this year uh, talked about South Asian recovery of some 8% uh, in 2021. And remember, uh, in 2020, South Asia's growth collapsed to minus 8.4%. So, you know, this is a, a really sharp kind of uh, prospect that people are thinking about. Now, much of this really reflects India, uh, which has this huge weight in the South Asian growth rate. Now, in the Sri Lankan case, if the official uh, forecasts materialize, um, the central bank thinks we could have growth of around 5% this year. Uh, this is up from what they announced a, a few days ago of minus 3.9% in 2020. Um, now, others, of course, are much more pessimistic on Sri Lanka. They think the hit will be something like 5% in 2020. And in the upside, if we're lucky, we would get, say, 2%, one and a half to 2%. So, you know, there is a range of opinion there. Um, now, for sure, unemployment and poverty that we have seen because of COVID, and a lot of this is hidden unemployment, hidden poverty, will continue for some time and be a major risk factor uh, going forward. Now, a return to positive growth, however, if we are lucky, will mean that the economic transformation process in Sri Lanka and the rest of South Asia will get ignited. And there are at least six or seven things that we might see in this. And I'll just mention these briefly. And I know our distinguished panelists from industry will talk in much greater detail. Uh, one shift in Sri Lanka that I think is really interesting is that garment firms may continue, and particularly the large firms, to internationalize uh, their production globally. We've had uh, large firms moving into um, Bangladesh as one area. Uh, some have moved into India. Uh, some have even moved into bits of Africa, uh, Latin America, and even uh, one large firm uh, set up some sort of facility in the United States. So uh, this strain will continue and it's pretty much uh, for reasons of market access, uh, for cheap labor, for quotas. Uh, so that trend will continue. A related trend is that undoubtedly these firms will uh, tend to want to innovate, particularly product innovation, to make more complex products so that they can retain their advantage. 
A second uh, possibility for the Sri Lankas and others in South Asia is really uh, taking up uh, global value chain segments, parts of industry that are leaving China as costs rise. Um, and th this may occur in bits of electronics, bits of auto, bits of engineering. Um, and there is some tendency for the large for in countries, India, Bangladesh, um, and so on to be key in this. Vietnam is another, but smaller countries might get into niche uh, areas of production. Um, a third area is that the boom in the digital economy, uh, as well as e-commerce is bound to continue, uh, something we saw in the pandemic, um, and will deepen, and uh, this will also extend to government services. And I think this will be a really exciting development which will speed up efficiency. And Sri Lanka uh, seems uh, quite poised to exploit some of those chances. And in a small country, those digital gains can be hugely important, particularly improving not only private sector opportunity, but also uh, government service delivery across many spectrums. Um, uh, another area uh, is really um, whether Sri Lanka can shift more of its trade, which is very much centered on Europe and North America for historic reasons and also because of multi-fiber agreement and other uh, buying uh, issues uh, towards Asia. This is a stated uh, point in the government. And, uh, you know, we import a lot, by the way, from Asia, but we don't export very much. Uh, our, we have trade deficits with China, India, and most of ASEAN. Um, and, you know, there's a real moot point as to whether our industrial structure allows us to export uh, in that way to those countries, but certainly we have to try. Um, and there are some trade barriers, but there's also a lack of information which we've got to try to deal with. Um, yet another shift we might see um, is the rise of the Colombo port city in the next uh, five years uh, to become a regional financial center and also be a conduit for modern service development in Sri Lanka. And uh, the real question is, you know, have we got the wherewithal, the laws, the skill base, et cetera, to make that work um, in a way that this becomes something of a hub between Dubai and Singapore uh, that we, we might, you know, use it to, 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 to build Sri Lanka as we go to higher and higher levels of income. Uh, likewise, there's the Hamantota industrial zone. Will that be a magnet for these value chains that may come out of East Asia, but also Indian investment that wants to invest in the region? and so on. Um, then there is a mood point, which I know Mr. Kure will talk about, is to whether tourism can actually come back um, in the short run under these controlled health protocols. And uh, you know, it would be a fascinating issue of whether people will want to pay to come on a holiday, but it's subject to stringent regulations, at least to recapture this dream of ours of getting 2 million tourists and whether this is possible in this era uh, going forward. Undoubtedly, it's possible in the medium term, but whether it's possible in the short run. Uh, now, any recovery, of course, um, will be clouded by big uncertainties and downside risks. Um, one big downside risk is whether we will actually exist this pandemic, exit the pandemic uh, so easily uh, in Q1 or even Q2 this year, even with the vaccine. The new strain um, has put a bit of a dampener whether this current set of vaccines are uh, useful to this new strain. There's the whole issue of infrastructure and the ramping up of production. Um, we also have in Sri Lanka's case, these unfavorable debt dynamics, uh, which are problematic for us. Um, and we have geopolitical competition. Uh, and then there's a question raised by the rating agencies outside and indeed uh, people like JP Morgan and others, um, international investors, um, whether Sri Lanka's pandemic and economic strategy is effective. And that's a very important risk factor, particularly where we are trying to seek FDI in Sri Lanka. Um, so it's a very open question in South Asia as well as Sri Lanka as to whether we're going to see a kind of a V-shaped recovery or are we going to kind of have a bathtub-shaped U with a long period along the bottom, uh, you know, going into 2021 and 2022, um, or even a stop-start W uh, kind of pattern of growth. And that, that's kind of boring. These alphabets sound uh, comical, but actually they are very serious in terms of representation. Um, now, the last point I want to make, and, and, and please uh, indulge me for 30 seconds more, is that um, I think a refined strategy uh, offers Sri Lanka a sporting chance of success in its quest for transformation and growth in this uh, post-COVID era. Um, you know, it's worth noting, and Sri Lanka has been maligned by many outside, particularly, um, for, and people haven't paid attention to some of the things we've done to tackle the fallout. 
you know, we've done a monetary stimulus, uh, which, which has been quite useful because we are constrained on the fiscal side, as Dr. Kumarasamy talked about. Um, and we put a lot of downward pressure on, on bank rates. Uh, and some of this is being passed on um, by the banks and the finance companies to industry and so on. Although there are some issues about the take up uh, for various reasons. There's asymmetric information problem. There remains a collateral problem. Uh, demand and other issues are also there uh, on the take up of credit. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. Uh, debt moratoriums for business have been provided, particularly uh, for small and medium enterprises. Um, there were restrictions on car imports and non-essential imports. And, and by the way, WTO rules allow this as a temporary measure for short-term balance of payments difficulties. The, the real question is whether uh, Sri Lanka can either deepen the import substitution so we can get to exports or indeed exist from import substitution uh, before we hit that stage where this becomes unsustainable, particularly in a country of 21, 22 million people. Um, and therein lies the regional cooperation issue Mr. Nag was talking about. Are we able to, for instance, build the trade agreements with say India and China and ASEAN, which will allow us to you know, reduce the risks and the difficulties of a small domestic market. And so we have a market of you know, multiple billions with if you have China, India, uh, and ASEAN involved in that by, by trade agreements, um, um, which, are, which are very important on the regional side as one aspect. Another thing we've done is try to uh, get financial assistance from our development partners. There was a swap with the Reserve Bank of India, I think earlier on for some 400 million. Uh, there's a billion dollar swap being talked about. The China Development Bank has also provided money and so on. And so we've tried very hard. We, we've sort of said no to an IMF program which could unlock other resources. And there's a whole debate point around that, which we may talk about today um, as to whether the IMF program is, is a useful vehicle and so on. Now, the point related to this is that Sri Lanka needs to build on these measures um, by formulating a, a much more comprehensive pro-poor agenda, which is also business friendly um, and keep it in place for three to five years, a kind of a flexible program um, and we see elements of this agenda, but it looks a bit ad hoc-ish. Um, there's a rhetoric reality gap, uh, which may be an issue. And in a document that the Pathfinder Foundation put out under the chairman seat of Dr. Kumarasamy, a, a group of uh, business people, academics and others, um, came up with some ideas under the heading of an economic vision for a post-COVID-19 Sri Lanka in April. And I think some of those ideas are still very useful. And, uh, some headlines may be, uh, we need to modernize social protection systems um, and we need to improve the efficiency of agriculture here. Uh, and this is to protect human life, but also to ensure uh, poverty levels can be brought down uh, to pre-COVID times. Uh, we need to move to structural reforms. Uh, and I think it will be gradual because we've never really done uh, big bang reforms in this country. But those reforms should cut red tape, uh, which is very important. Uh, there's too many redundant regulations. We should invest in skills and infrastructure, particularly trade-related infrastructure. Uh, if we want to connect to, say, regional markets through the BIMSHEC initiative and others, um, we need to secure markets <coughs> major trading partners uh, through perhaps trade agreements and other ways of dealing with non-tariff measures. We've got to have much more prudent macroeconomic management um, to build our reserves and to avert the risk of a debt crisis. Uh, this debt crisis risk is looming potentially larger on the horizon for Sri Lanka. And a further second and third round COVID could uh, be quite disastrous on our foreign reserves if, if other sectors don't pick up, uh, particularly exports and investment. Um, we've got to really look much more um, rationally at what we mean by regional cooperation and integration with Asia, if that's what our objective is. Um, and last, we've got to improve the consistency and coordination of, of policy here, which uh, again are, are not at the level we would like. Uh, so, so thank you very much. I, I may have gone over. Uh, thank you so much, Chess, for your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vignaraja. Uh, excellent presentation. I think you have laid the stage very well, Ganesh. Uh, one issue that I have always felt a uh, challenge for uh, countries like Sri Lanka, uh, as a matter of fact, all countries, but certainly for uh, economies like Sri Lanka, is to be very clear, where is the country's strategic 
stroke comparative advantage and then pursue it consistently. And I think uh, Ganesh, you made a very good point about have a program and then sort of, you know, whatever the business agenda, sorry, pro-business or pro-poor agenda is, then stick with it for three to five to 10 years. And so therefore, one is the issue of comparative advantage and the other one is the issue of consistency. And we'll talk about that more as we go along. So in uh, thinking along those lines about the areas of comparative advantage or where it could be possible sort of, you know, emphasis, as Dr. Kumar Swami said, right, in his opening comments, we thought of four areas uh, where we thought, among many others, but four areas where Sri Lanka might sort of, you know, think of focusing. And of course, one of them is the manufacturing sector, because that's ultimately, as Ganeshan was mentioning, you move up the Kusnets curve, you move, move up the transformation path, you go from agriculture into industry, but it's difficult to just go straight into services. You've got to go into manufacturing. You've got to, those are the ones which will be much more uh, job creating, labor absorbing sectors. And there, Sri Lanka uh, has uh, some very uh, interesting uh, success stories. Uh, then of course, the IT sector and tourism and the financial services. So those are the four areas that Dr. Kurma Swami had identified. And it's my great pleasure to now invite Mr. Premaratne to, to take the floor. And while of course, you know, we'd like to hear about, uh, you know, your views about your sector as a whole and how it fits in with Sri Lanka's vision as it were. Uh, let me just put it in the context, if you could kindly elaborate and elucidate us on that. Uh, that large garment firms like yours, like Brandex, uh, in a way have really become very impressive third world MNCs, uh, setting up manufacturing plants globally. Uh, now, the question in my mind is that, what uh, do you think might happen in the post COVID era? Has there been a structural shift that has happened? And what benefits does the emergence of homegrown SMEs, uh, MNCs, uh, have for Sri Lanka's growth of the garment industry in particular, but also the SMEs in general? Because ultimately, I think the challenge that all societies face is how to create well-paying, sustainable employment. And as we move out of agriculture and move into manufacturing. Uh, Mr. Premaratne, if you can sort of, you know, keep that perspective in your, in your response. So I invite Mr. Premaratne to the floor now. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that question. And thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this uh, webinar today. Uh, so to take uh, a step back and kind of set context to your question, I think uh, when you're a part of a global industry, um, it is important to understand that your buyers have the choice, your customers have the choice to buy from anybody around the world, which means that you will have to, at some point of time, think global. Uh, otherwise, you will you tend to lose uh, the business and the market share. So that's kind of the, the background that sets in because obviously the uh, our customers who are the global buyers uh, will look at the cost advantage, will look at spreading their geographical risk because obviously they don't want to concentrate too much of manufacturing or, or production in one country. So they would like to spread their risk by putting them in different uh, countries uh, and also the uh, free trade agreements and the duty benefits that uh, are offered by different countries. Um, and, and these uh, are few of the factors uh, that make the buyers to look at uh, spreading their supply chains to different regions as well as different countries. So in doing so, obviously, as a, as a corporate in a, in, a, in a particular country, you may have a market share, but you will see that you with the relationship in a B2B business growing, uh, naturally, you have the opportunity to work with that same customer brand or the buyer and uh, grow your business if you're ready to move with the location strategy. Uh, that's been adopted by 
uh, the customers in most instances. For instance, uh, to, to offer the duty benefits uh, uh, on certain instances to, to split the geographical risk spread. Uh, so in those contexts, it's important to see beyond your single manufacturing location or, or geography and spread your wings to go uh, out there to take advantage so that you will at least not lose your business. Uh, maybe you will lose that business uh, from Sri Lanka, but you will still uh, not lose it as a company uh, because it's only the manufacturing piece that might be moved out of Sri Lanka if Brandix or MAs or Hydromini or, or you know, the yellow clothing, if, if we uh, move our manufacturing to another country. But we do keep rest of the activities, which we normally refer as the front end activities of, of this industry, uh, within the country and those resources and jobs will retain. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, when we, Brandix, I'll take from Brandix, when we um, uh, went into India in 2006, where we set up a thousand acre uh, parallel special economic zone, um, our main uh, aim there was to win the business from uh, L Brands. Uh, at the time, the Victoria's Secret, uh, the pink business that they had, uh, so Victoria's Secret decided that they want to uh, uh, reduce the geog geographical exposure in Sri Lanka and spread their uh, manufacturing base uh, to India. Uh, so obviously, if Brandix had not gone there, they would have picked up another vendor in India. So surely we managed to get there, uh, set up shop and grow with Victoria's Secret in India. But I must highlight that India, what we do is manufacturing. The front end activities that I mentioned earlier, the product development, uh, design, uh, sourcing, planning, all those jobs, which are predominantly white collar jobs are in Sri Lanka. So to your questions, to, to, uh, uh, to, to be specific, you said, what will Sri Lanka have in this context if these MNCs take it? Well, while manufacturing moves, don't forget that the front end activities are still performed in Sri Lanka. So we have a lot of white collar jobs that continue. And um, most of uh, the, the larger companies uh, in the industry uh, do have their trading activities performed in Sri Lanka uh, so that the foreign foreign exchange comes to Sri Lanka and it's been subcontracted to uh, the other manufacturing locations out there. So in that context, there is benefit that you will retain in uh, the home country in Sri Lanka uh, in, in certain areas, including the forex uh, inflows, including the funding solutions. The banking system is uh, getting uh, connected through that. So your becoming global, but you don't completely move out of your uh, home base. And it's, it's kind of a, uh, a value addition at two locations. And obviously, uh, when we do so, we have been um, moving out, uh, like Brandix, we have moved out to uh, India, Bangladesh, uh, as well as uh, to, to Haiti uh, in, in the Central American region. And in the meantime, uh, uh, MAS has uh, multiple locations that includes uh, same countries I mentioned, plus um, even Africa, Vietnam, etc. Um, uh, so as Hella Clothing, so as Hydromini. Uh, so, so some of the larger apparel uh, groups have been able to retain the business without letting it go out of uh, uh, those companies and, and retain the, at least the front end activities in Sri Lanka uh, so that country benefits in overall scheme of things uh, while we uh, move certain part of manufacturing. And certain part of manufacturing that moves, other part of the manufacturing stays on, but you, are, uh, you become a Sri Lanka based uh, uh, global uh, company on one side. Now, uh, your added question there is what happens after COVID uh, with this situation? Well, I don't think there will be uh, significant changes to that particular aspect of, of going global in the apparel industry. Uh, when you look at uh, when you look at uh, the post COVID era, but of course certain um, moves, certain decisions may get accelerated uh, 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 compared to what it would have been pre COVID. So that's one angle to it. And also uh, from an SME perspective, I think the difference between maybe a large uh, uh, corporate versus SME uh, here is that SMEs may not have the type of resources that are needed to. Um, uh, go global or maybe to take advantage out of some of the other uh, design development uh, and other front end activities. So in that context, obviously what we've seen is that Sri Lanka's relevance stays on. And in that uh, light, uh, most of the time we've seen that with these large buyers continuing in Sri Lanka because the front end activities are mainly performed in Sri Lanka, it also gives the advantage to have uh, officers of these buyers 
to be located in Sri Lanka. And through that, there will be certain subcontract orders that go beyond the main large corporates, and that helps the SME sector as well. And we've seen this live. For example, Victoria's Secret has their own office here. And same as uh, uh, some of the other uh, PBH group, uh, and, and uh, the, which have, holds the Calvin Klein and some of the other large Tommy uh, Hilfiger and some of the other large brands. So essentially, uh, I, in my uh, thinking is that this strategy has helped Sri Lanka to retain value addition uh, uh, and in, a, in an area which uh, probably is where we can actually add value. For instance, uh, uh, if you look at uh, the US and UK, uh, uh, London or New York, where some of these design activities were performed 15 years ago, today we are doing that in Sri Lanka because we have been able to set up the infrastructure accordingly. So that's the first phase that I wanted to add uh, in that context, your question. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Indrajit, over to yeah. you. Thank, thank you, thank you, Rajat. Now, if I may move on to uh, Vivan and the ICT sector, as we are a little bit behind on the schedule, I'm going to just be very, um, try to be concise anyway in, in posing the uh, questions. Uh, if you can frame your comments, Stephen, around three issues, if I may uh, pose them to you. One is what have been the key drivers of the success of the ICT sector so far? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it has been arguably the most successful expo export segments um, in recent years. So what are the key drivers of success so far? Then what are the opportunities that are emerging uh, or are likely to emerge in a post-COVID world? And thirdly, and, and uh, the whole HR side, one of the constraints that are constantly mentioned uh, is, is the, the, um, whether we have enough people to take advantage of the opportunities uh, that are arising. Uh, so if I can, you know, if you can frame your responses uh, around those three issues, that'd be very helpful. Thank you. I, thank you, Andrew. Um I think uh, I feel very blessed to be part of an industry that is currently at about 1.5 to 1.7 billion. Um, to grow to, and a plan to grow to 5 billion by the next three to four years. Um, um, and I, I believe this target is very achievable and I'll, I'll go into some reasons why in, in, in a bit. If you look at our workforce, we have roughly 86,000 people in IT and about 26,000 in, in BPM. And if you look at how we've grown year on year, it's been about 20% uh, CAGR, even during times of war. Um, and, I, and I think uh, it's primarily because this industry is uh, a global industry that you know, um, you know, garments can't disrupt and, and policy can't necessarily um, um, you know, influence because it's, it's all IP driven. Um, and I, I, you know, if you compare um, us globally, uh, if you compare us with India, um, India's IT BPM export is about 135 billion, okay, uh, currently, and their plan is to go to 200 billion. Um, if you look at Philippines, uh, who is more focused on on the BPM side, there uh, they have reached about 35 billion. So I think in that context, I believe, um, you know, the five billion target is a very achievable target simply because even just one state in India does about four to five billion with a similar population to ours uh, in Sri Lanka. And furthermore, um, we have uh, Indian companies uh, such as uh, recently HCL come and set up in Sri Lanka as an N plus one destination. And their target is to grow to, you know, close to 50, 55,000 uh, people. Um, so I think when you compare ourselves globally, um, when you compare say Philippines, they're very positioned as a BPM destination. And when you look at India, what's worked for them is they try to focus on software, which is which is working out for them better than than uh, you know uh, it, it's worked out better for them in the long term. But the markets that we focus on, which are UK, USA, uh, Japan, the Nordics, um, uh, Australia, uh, we are positioned uh, simply because we don't have the numbers India India does. We position ourselves as um, uh, you know, I, I think a, a better strategic partner if you're focused on smaller numbers and quality. So I think 
globally that's been our position is you know if you're not looking at hundreds and thousands of people uh, we think sri lanka has a lot of add value to add through quality and the kind of work uh, we do if you look at the other position that we've taken um, recently with the with um, island of ingenuity and our branding around um, being an island of ingenuity there are two things that we really look at there uh, one thing is um, the word ingenuity has genuineness in it and we like to think that the sri lankan you know workforce is very genuine in what they do and very upfront uh, with their work um, but also ingenuity is where we're trying to focus on innovation and aspects of um, can we help uh, create products where um, where we're trying to log into large supply chains where we're helping them build products rather than uh, just being an IT offshore destination. So we're trying to go up the value chain in terms of adding value. Um, and the third thing I'd like to talk about maybe a bit later is how we position, we can position ourselves globally and we talked about opportunities as maybe being a startup friendly nation. Okay. Um, you, you touched upon a point about the workforce. Now to reach the $5 billion target, uh, there are certain issues that we face. Um, um, uh, and and you know, I, I, this is no means a complaint because I think the IT industry has got a lot of tax incentives and has been supported, but there are a few more things that we need to get right. And, and one is definitely um, the, the workforce, right? So if you look at the number of graduates coming out of O level is about 300,000. If you look at uh, A level, it's about 120,000. And if you look at our tertiary education system, it's only uh, 40,000 people. The balance about another 40 go into um, like uh, AAT, uh, et cetera. So kind of uh, diploma courses. Uh, but if you look at that 40,000, the number of graduates coming out with IT speciality is only 7,000 pe people. Um, and uh, 40,000 in the tertiary education tend to do, uh, out of the 40,000, 23,000 tend to do arts um, where they're not readily available um, for IT and, um, you know, um, to be employed in, 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 in IT. So we have a huge issue there where if we want to reach 5 billion and if you look at our uh, mean revenue per person being, you know, rising consistently, um, we're not going to reach those numbers with the current, uh, with, with the current graduates, number of graduates we have. So we have to work on increasing the number of graduates, especially in IT, or look at reskilling some of the, the people available um, in the market, um, you know, uh, locally as well, maybe with arts degrees, reskilling them into IT BPM. And I think that's definitely possible. Uh, and we put, as I think Slatscom has done various things to, to do this, including working with private sector and public sector on, on improving the skills. Um, but more than even increasing the numbers, I'd like to propose that we need, um, we need to go up the value chain again, right? Uh, so if you look at um, IT, I mean, uh, you can get an IT degree, but where the skill sets are scarce are are probably in things like AI, data science, um, robotics, uh, you know, uh, industrial automation. Those kind of things are what uh, probably are the rare skill sets that that people are not able to find. And I think um, you know, education has become such a commodity. And when I say commodity, you know, you can get a degree online today if you if you you know from from MIT if you really have the time. Um, so I think it's more than having a degree is how to apply that education in a practical manner um, in inside companies. And I think that will make us uh, very agile. And and we now have you know a lot of courses on on data science on robotics available online, and we just need to enable those things. For people to to have access to them, learn from them, and then apply them in a, in a job, and I think that's maybe some some way we can differentiate ourselves. Um, another thing I believe um, we have to do uh, if we want to reach a five billion target is really improve the amount of IP coming out of out of Sri Lanka, right? Um, one of you know adding to the basket of goods 
uh, I, I think, uh, you know, we'll be adding in terms of complexity when you look at AI, robotics, et cetera, but also you need to, uh, you need to build companies here that have IP, right? And I think that really comes with uh, startups and enabling uh, small to medium sized companies, uh, you know, come up uh, in from Sri Lanka with IP and a unique kind of value proposition. So to do that, I think there's a whole bunch of regulation that needs to, you know, um, happen. Uh, I'll just give a quick few examples. You know, um, one thing is uh, being a startup here, you don't have a lot of access to funding. And I think um, setting up the environment for startups to get funding and have access to funding um, is, is, is something we need to work on. Um, we proposed, um, you know, removing double taxation for funds to set up here. Uh, that would be a huge plus. Um, um, we proposed, uh, you know, policies around enabling startups to have market access because we, you know, as explained before, Sri Lanka is such a small country, you need to look at uh, from going from Sri Lanka outside as well. Um, and, and also, I think, you know, there are laws that can be enabled, um, um, you know, around crowdfunding, fintechs, etc. So there's a whole plethora of laws and, and things that need to be enabled locally for IP to be built locally. Um, and I think if we can sort that out, I think there will be a third position that we can take as Sri Lanka as a startup friendly nation, um, which will as, and, and will enable us to kind of position Sri Lanka as a kind of gateway to, to South Asia. Um, so I, I think that's probably the, the, the third thing that we really want to look at. Um, and I and I believe just to you know just really quickly say about COVID, I I really you know don't see it as um, uh, necessarily as a, as as a negative thing for the IT industry because it's actually been a silver lining because it's actually accelerated uh, many people's or many companies' path to digitization, right? So um, I, I think IT companies have actually. Uh, benefited from from companies thinking, hey, how do we uh, um, become um, more IT enabled going forward? That, thank thank you very much, Jeevan. Before I turn to uh, Hiran Kure, let me just uh, uh, convey a housekeeping message to those of you who are participating in the webinar. If you have any questions, please type them in in the Q and A segment, um, or if you want to speak, put put your hands up. Uh, now, um, let me now turn to Hiran now. Um, Hiran, just a couple of questions. One, a short-term one, in the immediate term, what are the prospects of getting, you know, tourism under biosecurity con conditions going? Um, what progress is being made on that? But then more in the more medium to long term, the tourism industry has been remarkably resilient. You know, you had the conflict, you've had the, the tsunami, the bombings, et cetera. And each time the industry has bounced back. And usually within one season, you have seen that you have been able to get back uh, to near normalcy or normalcy. So this time around, what are the prospects again of bouncing back? And how do we need to position uh, the tourism sector in Sri Lanka for the post pandemic world? You can frame your responses around those yeah. questions and convey right. anything yeah. else that you want to convey as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Kumaraswamy, and thank you for inviting me thank you for the path found uh, find the foundation uh, in the current uh, guidelines given in the immediate future to be very honest i don't see very many tourists wanting to come here uh, with with uh, so many guidelines i'm mean, i'm not sure whether any one of you would want to travel outside and come back again and uh, you know uh, pcrs being taken every other day almost and uh, all sorts of guidelines. So it's really not, not a real holiday. We missed, I think we missed an opportunity uh, somewhere around June, July, we should have uh, informed the, the Western world that Sri Lanka is a great place to spend the entire winter here. You know, because uh, look, at our, look at our country, you know, we are blessed with sunshine, we are blessed with fresh air. Uh, you know, those who are retired in Europe and the Americas and maybe even in uh, East Asian countries, you know, with our Hilaveda Kama and the Ayurveda immune boosting uh, opportunities, we had an opportunity to get these people here to spend the entire winter. I still think it's 
you know, now we almost missed the bus on that. So there'll be very few who will want to come uh, in this situation. And as we open uh, our country for tourism, unfortunately, the rest of the world is locking themselves in. So therefore, I, I can't see a major, major improvement in the numbers, uh, increase in numbers in the foreseeable future, at least until April this year. At the time, hopefully by then, uh, Europe uh, would have uh, uh, made use of the vaccines that they have and uh, the confidence levels uh, uh, would hopefully increase by then. And, uh, and then the restrictions, the guidelines will be much more uh, customer friendly. At this point in time, it is not a friendly uh, approach uh, to welcoming tourists. So therefore, I don't see uh, much, uh, much of an opportunity for, for them to come here. Uh, your second question was uh, on, the, on the medium term and the positioning, right? Yeah. Well, sorry. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the positioning side, we actually, we still have, we are still struggling to position ourselves. You know, if I go back to the end of the conflict in 2009, and thereafter, uh, we had a tremendous inflow of tourists, so much so by about uh, January, February of 2010, we were telling our people, look, don't handle any more bookings. We didn't have enough vehicles. We did not, we did not have enough uh, uh, guides. We did not have enough bedrooms. So we were, we were in a situation where we were saying, hey, uh, you know, st stop handling. We, 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 were, we were in a serious overbooked uh, situation. And then the government at that time focused on infrastructure development. They said, look, uh, you know, go on a building spree. We need more rooms. We, know, we need more infrastructure. And so we went on that uh, process. But we failed from then on until now to position the country. We failed to position the country. 2015 to 2019, our confidence levels went down even before the Easter Sunday bombings, our confidence levels went down because no decisions were taken. Uh, the, we, we, we've, uh, we, we had money in the Tourism Promotion Bureau, that money went back to the treasury because the money was not utilized to position the country. We got, we had a situation where 50% of the arrivals were going into the informal sector. Now I'm not at all against the informal sector. I think we need the informal sector and tourism is for everybody, not just for a few of us, so, but a country with, if we are getting over 50% in the informal sector, then there's a problem. And the government at that time failed to realize that. And they were inactive. The most inactive government we had was then. And now we, unfortunately, after this government came in, uh, uh, sadly, the COVID came in. With the COVID, this, this also has gone into a level of hibernation and trying desperately to you know, get this COVID out of this country. And I'm not sure whether that is the best available strategy uh, there is, whether are we focusing on eradicating the virus or are we learning to live with the virus and allow the economy to grow? If you look at Sri Lanka, thankfully, we, we have uh, lost maybe 250 people and they also, uh, we lost them because there, there were other terminal illnesses in them and very few may have died only due to COVID. So therefore, there is, a, there is a need now to look at how we can revive tourism without putting the fear of Moses into the people's minds. I think the media has to play a leading role in this. If you watch, I mean, I today I watch uh, Singhala News every day, 6.55 to 7.30, I watch the Singhala channels. Oh my God, you know, when you look at, listen to them, right? The way, way people are being taken in at gunpoint into these COVID centers and all of that, it, it really frightens people. And that, and then on top of that, when people see anybody other than the color of ours in this country, they think, oh, these guys are importing uh, the virus. If there are certain guidelines for international airlines to follow, when people fly, you can rest assured that at least a good 95 to 98% will be COVID free. And then when they come in also, there are one or two guidelines which will prevent uh, you know, them from bringing the COVID into the country. 
then there are certain guidelines in the hotels that are you know safe and secure where when we when we look after them under those guidelines <clears throat> we can kind of guarantee that our staff will not gather this disease and spread among their local communities for example right now the england cricket team is staying in one of our hotels in gaul right and we are following the guidelines given by the the authorities and um, we are very very confident that the english players and our staff i mean you know uh, for us our associates are equally important as uh, english cricketers who are with us uh, in the hotel that all of them will be secure so therefore if we follow those guidelines then we shouldn't be so scared uh, to welcome these people mass tourism on the other hand is is history i mean you know i don't think we should focus on charter flights bringing in people i'm not from i mean it doesn't matter where but charters worked very well in the 1970s till about late 1990s thereafter the charter uh, operations died down and then the people you know they, they started traveling for different reasons uh, for food for experiences for culture for wildlife nature there so the mass tourism uh, subject should not be spoken of in our country we have a great opportunity now because since tourism is at a zero level now there is an opportunity to raise it up again properly positioning i have one final thing you know we are uh, sometimes i feel and i and i feel sad and whenever i bring this topic up i am told to shut up we have a, a problem with our identity are we ceylon are we are we sri lanka we are branding ceylon tea ceylon cinnamon ceylon sapphire and then we have sri lankan garments sri lankan cricket sri lanka tourism so we we sometimes people have asked me what's the name of your country where are you from are you ceylon are you sri lanka so i think the policy makers must decide it doesn't matter to me we can be ceylon it doesn't matter to me or are we sri lanka if we are sri lanka let's be proud of sri lanka and market sri lanka because we are going out into the world marketing and positioning a brand and when we have two names right am i going to brand myself as hiran or am i going to brand myself as john or jack or whatever then people are going to get confused so therefore we still haven't decided which which name that we are really proud of and with that the positioning of this country must start with the garments with it with with the agricultural products we have right we have a lot of things to position but then we need to decide are we going with ceylon are we going with sri lanka and then go at it uh, in a in a in a way in a joint way that because uh, as uh, mr nag said small can be advantages small can be really advantages and then tourism can play a massive role in developing the country i don't see tourism playing a massive role in this year it's a matter of survival for us government has given us a moratorium and so on so that moratorium is not only to help the hotels it's helping the banks as well you know if, because none of the hoteliers today can pay service the loans if the, you know so there is a large amount of money the commercial banks have lent to the hospitality sector so it is actually helping it's cushioning the bank while it's cushioning us it's cushioning the banks as well uh, to stay afloat because some of the banks are, are struggling because they they credit the interest but they don't get the cash so but be that as it may uh, they they are still you know it, it is a blessing that uh, we can still stay afloat hopefully by july august this year we should still see uh, more people coming in with less restrictions thank you thank you very much iran radhat let me hand over to you thank you sir uh let me move on to the uh fourth sector that we thought we'll talk a bit about and that is the uh financial sector uh and uh, i know that over the past several decades actually uh sri lanka has often talked about uh, emulating the success of established global financial centers like dubai and singapore i mean one you know is obviously the location and connectivity 
so, so as those have improved, particularly digital connectivity uh, and uh, financial sector governance and regulations and others, uh, I think Sri Lanka has justifiably had this ambition of developing, for example, the Colombo port city as a financial hub, maybe for South Asia, maybe broader and maybe global. Uh, so our next panelist, who again uh, doesn't need any introduction, Mr. Nishtar Kasim. Uh, Nishtar, I'd like to have you take this on, uh, knowing how deeply involved you are in the sector and thinking and writing about it. Is this a realistic ambition? Uh, and if so, uh, then what policies and other enabling uh, environment factors need to be put in place. So your thoughts, Nishtar. Thanks. Okay, thank you. As well as, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for Pathfinder as well. Um, I think uh, 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 the we, we have always had this ambition of becoming a financial center for, for a long time. Uh, but I think uh, Port City, when Port City was uh, conceptualized, uh, there was some hope. And then, of course, we had a two years, uh, a year plus suspension of the project, and now it's back on track. Uh, in between the suspension uh, and the resumption, uh, people went back on the idea about let's not make it a financial center, but look at some other development. So there's some confusion there, but I think now there is more clarity that they want to set up a financial center. Uh, I, I feel uh, though there are uh, centers like Karach, uh, Mumbai and Karachi, uh, uh, more, more, more robust centers, I think Sri Lanka, given the geopolitics in the region, uh, is, is, a natural, is a neutral location. There is a lot of, uh, I think there is natural affinity from South Asia for, for Colombo. Uh, at present, what do the Indians and the, let's say the Pakistanis or South Asians, how do they do? They, they, I, they, their options are Dubai or Singapore for their outward investments. So I think if Sri Lanka can present an alternative, then some of those investments will go to Sri Lanka. Uh, th that's point number one. And of course, as you did mention, we are geographically, we are sort of strategic. We have a very modern opportunity from the Port City uh, project. Uh, I think in terms of a model, I would suggest that uh, the Dubai Financial Center might be an ideal model for Sri Lanka than looking at Hong Kong, or Singapore, because uh, this port city is going to be a will have a different uh, will be having a different legal system or a jurisdiction in terms of so maybe Dubai Financial Center may be an ideal model to emulate uh, initially uh, because we there is some concern that there will be two legal systems in operation uh, given the port city uh, model and I think. More importantly, to um, uh, the legislation is upcoming. There is some uh, cabinet. I think last week proposed a port port city commission bill, which might which will outline what the plans are in terms of regulation and other aspects. Uh, beyond, um, I I think if you look at Sri Lanka as a as a, as a as a hub for a financial center. <clears throat> Uh, there are more things to be done in terms of reforms, deregulation, particularly, uh, and of course, consolidation in the sector because there is some perception that there are too many banks and finance companies at present. Uh, given the capital requirements, uh, it requires uh, much more aggressive consolidation in the industry. And recently, a deregulation com uh, committee was appointed by the president. I think it's a, just another, it's an yet another uh, committee. But if someone really looks back, there have been enough uh, uh, committees suggesting reforms and deregulations in the financial sector. Uh, uh, whereas, of course, this new committee is looking at much broader deregulation in the country. Thank you. 
Thank, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. Raja, before we get to the Q&A, right. uh, we have Mr. Suresh Dimel, who is the chairman of the Export Development Board online. So may I, may I invite Mr. Dimel uh, to share a few uh, insights with us from his perspective? Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Please go ahead, Mr. Dimel. Yeah, you're on now. Okay, I'm on. <laughs> Good afternoon and thank you. I wasn't expecting to speak here, but uh, I'm one of the newest uh, public servants, I guess, at the moment. And uh, everybody's been asking me what the export targets are for 2021. And I don't know Dr. Kumara Swami, but I, I am still asking people, how can I answer that question? Because I don't think I have lived in a more uncertain time ever in my life. And it's uh, a little, uh, well, you know, not that I'm not, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I don't know how to, uh, you know, there are obviously certain areas that we have seen resilience and expansion even and uh, there are some areas that have somewhat surprised us like the apparel sector down 40 percent um, and i'd like to hope that uh, you know that will improve some because that's very critical for our uh, future and um, but the it uh, sector and even uh, the agriculture sector seems to be doing good and I think our president is very motivated to improve the SME uh, sector, especially regional agriculture. And my guess is that uh, since everybody is going in for agriculture, we will have some uh, crops to export. But my uh, serious feeling is that Sri Lanka needs to go for go up the value chain as uh, we've been talking about today and look for niche markets. I think uh, even garments, uh, we started by catering to a lot of a variety of markets, but now we are definitely a niche market garment, fact, garment uh, producer because in the 70s we had um, labor. We had enough labor and it was relatively cheap. Today Sri Lanka has uh, expensive labor and our labor is maybe not as productive as our competitors. Um, I see that uh, quality production would be easier than quantity for us. So looking for new niche markets and um, and changing our, uh, diversifying our product basket would be the priorities right now. And hopefully we, uh, we might even have some new opportunities post COVID, uh, new markets as well as new products that we can uh, focus on. So the, the you know, um, I can be optimistic because of the new, uh, the change that uh, we might see. Uh, but our traditional apparel and so on, maybe I'm a little worried about. I mean, that's my, uh, I've just been in office uh, 25 days and I've been studying this because that's the, the number one question is what my uh, prediction is for 2021. And that's a little difficult to say, but I hope that, uh, you know, we will, in agriculture, we, that we will produce the right uh, product for export because uh, even in agricultural produce, even in spices, uh, if we go for the, uh, the common markets, uh, we won't be competitive because the prices are much lower. Um, for example, turmeric, uh, last month, uh, the turmeric prices in Sri Lanka were five times what they were in Europe. 
So, um, turmeric or ginger may not be a world, might not be a big export for Sri Lanka because the world market is quite low on that. But niche markets, um, you know, organic uh, spices, that can fetch good prices. And that's the, the focus we should have. And I think, you know, we have a lot of opportunity. If you look around Sri Lanka, there is a lot of uncultivated land. We must not go into like, thousands of acres of any crop because then you have to apply chemicals. If we do the, uh, the uh, traditional um, uh, home gardens uh, concept, I think uh, we might have a good export product basket. That's it for me, thanks. Thank you, Th thank you very much. Before handing over to Ms. Mr. Nag, uh, I um, just to respond to you, uh, Mr. Dimal, having spent a whole working life trying to make uh, forecasts, I can tell you that even in the most stable and predictable of times, forecasting is a highly precarious business. Uh, and, and if you stack up what uh, the major agencies in the world or individual countries in the world forecast and what the actual uh, outcome is, there's invariably a big gap. So I, I think you know, uh, coaches in sports, you know, the cricket, the rugby, whatever it is, they tell you, you know, get the processes right and the outcome will look after itself. So I think that's what we need to do. If we can get our policies right, if we can uh, get our, um, yeah, our deregulation exercise, which is now being initiated right, if we get those things right, the outcome will look after itself. You know, so that's, that's we, can, we can forecast, of course, everyone needs to forecast, but I think it's more, it's more important to get the policies and, and processes right. Mr. Nag, let me, I don't see anybody, uh, any questions at the moment. Uh, in the, so let me hand it over to you. If you have a couple of questions, then I also can follow after that. Right, uh, certainly, thanks, thanks, Najit. But on a lighter note on this issue of forecasting, uh, yeah. let me uh, assure Mr. Demel that when I was starting my professional life, Eons back, I worked for the Central Bank of Canada. I don't know if any of you knew that. I, I saw it on OCV. Yeah. And, and, and my mentor, one of my mentors, the then deputy governor, told me that Rajat, and of course, we were in econometric forecasting and all that. He said, let me tell you, never forecast the level and the time at the same time. So you can say Dow will go to 5,000 or 20,000, but don't say by when. And if you say the time, don't tell the level. So, so that, <laughs> that was one way of avoiding any post uh, forecast uh, embarrassments. Uh, but on a more serious note, uh, thank you very much to all the panelists for a very rich discussion. And we'll come back to some of them. But first of all, uh, I, I would like to open it to the floor for questions. I do see two questions uh, uh, in Rajit, if I uh, may open. And I think. Uh, yeah, and and there was there's one on the uh, gender issue, which I think is a very very important one. And I should mention that we had purposely sort of kept this discussion to the sectoral level, and not got into the cross sectoral issues of which gender would be the most important. So absolutely, no question that gender issues are very very important. And the question from uh, Ms. Caldera is if I may read it out uh, on your behalf, uh, what innovative means are being used to expand the labor force in Sri Lanka? Uh, female labor force participation is abysmal. How can we change this for the better? Uh, anybody on the panelists uh, would want to take this on? How about starting off with Ganesh? Ganesh, any thoughts? Uh, yes, uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, there is a, a gap in labor force participation rates between men and women. So factually, that is broadly correct. There seems to be a kind of a life cycle in Sri Lanka. So uh, in terms of education, women's participation rates are very high. Uh, primary, secondary, and even tertiary education uh, rates are very high. But there's a big drop off as they go from tertiary into the labor market. And probably two things seem very important. One is uh, 
uh, provision of childcare facilities in companies, uh, you know, uh, which is very important. Uh, and then there is another issue about, uh, you know, education to prevent harassment on transport. This is another common issue. And then last issue, uh, which is there is really an issue about social attitudes. Uh, typically, uh, you know, women, when they get married, even if they're educated, are somewhat discouraged from going to work uh, on the grounds that they must look after the children and so on. But I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. So there are, there's a bunch of issues we have to consider, uh, particularly if we want to deal with this issue of a lack of labor force in an aging population. We are different to the rest of South Asia, where our population is aging, more like East Asia, not as bad. Uh, compared to India, which is a more useful population. Th thank you very much. If I can just add a small yeah, thing. Please. Um, I think in the IT sector, typically, actually, the uh, ratio of women to men is not, is not so bad. Actually, there is a high women participation, I'm sure, uh, in the textile industry as well. But there are small things that we are doing. Um, for example, in Hatch, we have uh, a women-led entrepreneurship program that we've been running for about a year and a half now, and we've actually gone through uh, I think six iterations of it, and we plan to have um, our accelerator. So we, we ran an incubation, and now we're running an accelerator where we graduated about 60 women-led entrepreneurs through various programs, um, um, encouraging them to start their own businesses. Um, so maybe uh, this might be one aspect by which um, definitely, I think women, um, and now with working from home, uh, can definitely be encouraged to participate in, in the workforce as well, being entrepreneurs themselves and empowering themselves. Thanks. Thanks, Jeevan. Uh, any other colleagues on the panel would want to come in? Any comments? I think the one, one sorry, does anybody else want to speak? Hiran, you wanted to speak. Go ahead. Well, I, I, I kind of agree with uh, Ganesh's comments that, you know, sometimes it's not easy uh, for females. I think one, one, I can share some positive stories. We do manage two hotels in... Uh, Jaffna, and a lot of people told me, you know, uh, predominantly Hindus and a few Christians over there. And they said, look, don't even think of employing any females. And then we ran a training program. And we're happy to say that out of 60 who participated in the training program, about 25 were females. And about 18 of them joined the uh, hotel uh, that we manage over there. And that was a tremendous success. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, if, if we really uh, it, there are cultural issues as well, and if we, if we handle it well, uh, give them the due respect that they deserve, I, I think we can encourage more females to join even the hospitality sector. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ravishir. Inderjit, you wanted to come in? Oh, oh, yes, I just to say that, you know, the government has also uh, made, I, in my view, a correct move by uh, increasing the retirement age. Uh, I think there's a bit of pushback on it, but I think that's very important because having retirement at 55 or even 60, actually, in a country which has life expectancy, I think now in the mid 70s or more, uh, is not 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 uh, rational at a time when you know aging is accelerating. So I, I think that's a, it's a good move by the government, and I think that's something again that is. Uh, uh, one way of increasing uh, the labor force participation in the population. Thanks. Shall I shift to the next question, Please. if I may, Rajat? Yeah. Please, yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a question from an anonymous attendee. It says, in 2019, the Sri Lankan economy received US dollars 6.7 billion as remittances, which was capable of covering 84% of its trade deficit. With the fallout from the pandemic and the plight of Lankan migrant workers today, how can Sri Lanka recover from the socioeconomic impact? Any of the panelists want to take that? Um, I, I think I would say IP and building IP in Sri Lanka and building our own products and services and adding to the basket of goods that we, we have for export. Yeah. I, I must say that, that I, I, I have a somewhat um, heretical view on this. Uh, I, I have never been very comfortable about large numbers of Sri Lankan females having to go abroad to do the kind of work that they do. Uh, so I think what we need to do is really uh, along the lines of what Jeevan said, is really to get productive employment in our own economy going. Uh, 
to essentially create enough jobs so that people can earn a living in Sri Lanka and to make sure that we increase production in the tradable goods sector so that we earn and save foreign exchange so that we have a sustainable outcome in terms of our, our current account of our balance of payments. So that, that's the way to go. It's really to increase uh, exports to get efficient import substitution, uh, create higher value employment at home uh, rather than sending uh, our people abroad. In fact, there are shortages of labor in some of our key sectors, the leisure sector, the IT sector, the apparel sector, all the three key sectors we're talking about, all of them are facing facing uh, uh, labor shortages. So what we need to do is to keep our people at home, increase export earnings in those sectors and in other sectors, and to save foreign exchange also through increasing efficient import substitution. And uh, rather than you know having this situation of uh, 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 and all the social implications of large numbers of our, uh, our females uh, going abroad to work. Okay. Yeah, Ganeshan, okay. sorry. Yeah. I, I, just on uh, the, just, uh, okay, Ganeshan and then Hasita. Yeah, I, I just saw Ganeshan first. So Ganeshan yeah. and then Hasita, please. A very uh, quick point uh, related to this um, migrant issue um, and also of stimulating economic activity in the country um, and considering the modern sectors. I think one of the things we're not doing enough about is to try to attract young, uh, what they call overseas Sri Lankans back to Sri Lanka. Uh, this is, you know, second generation Sri Lankans who may have Sri Lankan parents but have grown out abroad. Um, and, uh, you know, they will come back and be entrepreneurs. They will bring not only skills, but also capital and also bring foreign connections. Uh, so, you know, we are spending a lot of effort on trying to attract multinationals, which may or may not come given, you know, our. Uh, conditions here, but people with a connection may come. And, you know, the two countries which are very good at having done this is one is India uh, with the uh, overseas Indian program. I wonder if Mr. Nag would uh, talk about that, the OCI card, which I think has been a great success, uh, but also, uh, you know, uh, Taiwan and uh, getting people back into China. And they're the largest investors in China, the overseas uh, Chinese. Uh, so, so I think this is something we should emphasize as well, particularly in these COVID times where foreign investment is particularly risk averse. Th thank you. Hasita, and then I'll hand it back to, uh, to you, Raja. Yeah, so uh, I, I was just trying to say that uh, the gap, the, there are two aspects of uh, uh, generally people going abroad, especially for uh, the domestic work to Middle East. Uh, so that workforce, one thing is the economic angle where the income, um, uh, additional income to be earned there compared to what they could probably earn here. Uh, and and uh, in that context, when you look at today, that economic gap is that uh, difference of income is uh, narrowing significantly. Uh, so uh, even in the apparel industry, I can speak for that because uh, there has been a lot of uh, uh, in, in increases that have come in in the payments, uh, including the benefits that have been offered. So that with that, the, the gap is narrowing on one side, but also there's another dynamic that we have to understand, which is the social angle to it. So sometimes going abroad, um, is seen as a uh, big thing in the village. Uh, and uh, probably the, the, there is some level of a campaign that is there which uh, uh, says uh, going abroad will be good for work rather than maybe working close to your house, uh, especially uh, in a apparel industry or in a hotel or wherever that you're talking about. So this particular aspect need to get also, uh, I, I would call it de-branded and rebranded. Uh, when we are looking at uh, our particular uh, branding side, so in the, even in the apparel industry, this is something we are thinking about uh, consciously to ensure that uh, we, we increase the workforce uh, by uh, take addressing and, and particularly addressing to that uh, segment who, who's looking forward to go abroad for different reasons outside the, the, the income aspect of it. So we have to, I think, uh, work as a community, as a government, as industry, together uh, to uh, to bring the bring about that differential uh, and and make sure that uh, we have that workforce uh, being uh, being utilized and being uh, also uh, empowered uh, in their in their own day-to-day uh, uh, -day life i think before i hand over to you rajat i think mush you wanted to say something uh yeah uh, sure. i just wanted to, uh, uh, just on the numbers on the remittances uh, we were trailing last year to 2019 numbers till about October. From October, 
uh, the remittances became positive year to date and it has started to grow actually so i think that's some good sign in terms of uh, in terms of uh, income earned uh, just want to clarify that, that there is no setback but going forward i don't know what the outlook situation covid related downturn in increases in some other large employing countries on that before i hand over to mush uh, 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 mr i i have a suspicion what that reflects yeah. is a substitution from the informal to the formal channels uh, so in terms right. of the actual inflows of foreign exchange into the country there may or may not have been an increase but yeah. what this does is it enables the central bank for instance to purchase some of this to build up our reserves so in that sense it's a positive thing mm -hmm. but i don't know in terms of the impact on incomes consumption investment etc savings etc in the country whether actually we've had an increase because i think there is a shift you know from informal to formal channels in terms of the money coming in uh, but but still yeah it, it it is it is holding up it's holding up pretty well that's true okay moshi wanted to say something uh, yes just a comment uh, firstly um, it's so impressive to see um, the captains of industry here hiran and uh, jeevan and uh, asita and of course, uh, my good friend uh, Nista, um, but I want to address the issue that Suresh raised, which is uh, what is the target and what is the goal and how do I answer it? Um, I would rather say, uh, as one of the panelists mentioned, uh, we should not be expecting a V-shaped recovery. We should expect the bath uh, recovery, which means that we, go down, we have gone down and there'll be a prolonged uh, recovery stage, and then hopefully uh, we, will, we will recover. In doing so, if I may use the bath analogy, this is the time where the baby is in the bath water, and we should not throw that out. We should, in fact, take the opportunity to clean up the baby and wash the baby. The baby is the economy and relieve the, the baby of all these constraints that are being imposed by the government. Um, because the captains of industry, the passion, the passion that is there uh, is palpable. And they are frustrated and we are frustrated by the chains that are put around. So I would urge that uh, working with the press that we try our level best to be able to indicate where are these chains, what is shackling the economy, and try to focus on that, because um, that is where I think the best service we can do in this interregnum, where uh, the flat curve uh, the, you know, it will cons constrain us, and we will all be getting more and more frust frustrated and let us get the government into the act, as opposed to preaching um, and asking uh, Suresh, for instance, um, we want more exports and you fail to get us more exports, so we will change the head of the organization. So, uh, so uh, I mean, that is inevitable if we do not focus on the binding constraints. Uh, and that's my point. And I think uh, all of us going forward might be able to play that role, uh, also working with the press uh, to be able to lobby for change and bringing about the regulatory aspect. One last point, there is a great opportunity in the port city, but there is a possibility of a great disaster where the port city is there and the government shackles uh, of regulation of regulation and constraints will not permit uh, the investors to come in and be able to, to deliver on what, um, for better or for worse, the Chinese have supported us with. Thank you. Uh, uh, Thank you, Rajat. Yeah, over to you. Before I take the next question, let me say how delighted I am as always to see Mohammed. 
particularly because he obviously got up at 3.30 in the morning his time to join us. Really appreciate that. You have given us a totally international dimension by your presence. <laughs> okay, uh, if I may move to the next question, it is basically a combination of environment come tourism. And the question says, most of Sri Lanka's development uh, takes place in the wet zones and doesn't that affect the environment badly? And therefore, which will also make tourism in Sri Lanka unattra unattractive in the long term. And I think uh, obviously, uh, oh, I don't see, it's my, ah, Hiran. Uh, Hiran, you would be obviously the right person to take this on and then others can join in. So Hiran, why don't you start, please? Did you say that the, most of the tourism takes place in the wet zone? No, development. I think what they were talking development? about. Yeah, infrastructure development in the wet zones, which obviously mm -hmm. affects the environment, which then clears the rainforest, which then affects tourism. So I think that was the... That was the connection. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. I mean, you know, that's that's news to me because uh, uh, most of the tourism development takes place along the coasts of Sri Lanka. That's where the uh, highest number of uh, accommodation facilities are. And uh, then the next uh, biggest development is in the cultural triangle. That is uh, Sigiriya, Dambul, uh, Polonnaru, Anuradhapura, that area. And then into the Candy Norelli area. So uh, there's very little, I mean, you know, if you take the Singaraja, which is uh, which is a natural, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, wonder of our country, uh, there's probably two, two or three hotels in that area. So there's not much of uh, uh, development there at all. So uh, I'm really not sure how that is going to impact. Also, I mean, you know, if, if development is carried out in a sensitive way, uh, it can it can enhance the environment rather than uh, degrade the environment. So uh, that's that's my take on it at the moment. Okay, uh, I'll come to Raja. There, 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 yeah, there is a broader kind of uh, environment climate change point I think implied in the question. Okay, uh, and you know, in Sri Lanka, the World Bank, in fact, has identified Sri Lanka as one of the, I think, five or six most vulnerable countries in the world to climate change. Uh, and so I think it becomes very important that we kind of mainstream uh, uh, sustainability issues into our planning processes, our budgeting processes. You know, that, that is something now I think we really seriously need to think about. In the short run, I hope we're going to be okay. I understand this year is neither a El Nino or La Nina year. So with, you know, uh, by the grace of God, hopefully we won't need to have to deal with any major environmental issues this year when we are trying to cope with the economic and health crisis. But sooner or later, I think, from what the experts are telling us, Sri Lanka is very vulnerable. And I'm not sure whether we are factoring this in our hope, as I said, our planning, our budgeting, etc. I think that we need to do more about more, more on that front. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Indrajit. As a matter of fact, I was going to make a very similar point that I think that question is a broader one in terms of environment. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Ganesh should remember the at the ADB some years back, we'd done a study called Asia 2050, looking at various issues, obviously climate change was one of them. And one of the most worrying uh, findings, Indrajit, was that of the 15 city, towns or cities along the coast, around the world, 15 out of the top 20 would be in Asia. 15 out of the top 20, and of course, Sri Lanka would be a very vulnerable one, and you're right, it's in the top sort of five or six. So I think the larger point here, and I think that's a very valid point raised by the person who is asking this question, is the environmental issues which will come into development uh, uh, planning for, for Sri Lanka. Uh, any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, we have already kept all of you for one hour and 45 minutes and we're almost on the dot. So Indrajit, let me hand it back to you to conclude. Okay. I, I think the, the next on the program is your remark, a closing remark. But before that, maybe we should ask the panelists and Ganeshan, anybody, uh, would you like to have any kind of closing remarks that you want to make? 
So I, I, I think Hasita, yeah. transformation. Shall, shall we go Hasita, Hasita, just put it up first, Ganesh. So Hasita and then Ganesh, please. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, no, I just wanted to add a couple of dynamics uh, that are coming out post-COVID because uh, now um, as we get out of this uh, uh, problem gradually, I think one of the things is uh, uh, businesses as well as as uh, uh, the, the workforce and also the government, all of us will have to look at is uh, not to go back to the old days, but to learn from the last nine, 10 months, uh, what took place and at least um, uh, take some of the positives that have, we have learned uh, uh, forward. For instance, I think uh, a lot of dynamics have come in the online uh, uh, business has uh, grown at a rapid pace uh, in the last nine months and mo most of us have got used to it. Um, and, and even in the Western world, uh, the numbers have grown dramatically. So that's a new model that probably can lead to uh, a drive efficiency on one side. On the other side, also the digitization and automation angle, especially the digitization, uh, uh, including what we are doing today. We've got uh, more webinars uh, uh, imparting knowledge and it happens quite uh, uh, fast, quite easily. So that's something that we should uh, look at how uh, digitization can should take a priority uh, in the post COVID era and also the working from home environments. I think uh, we've uh, now uh, gradually getting used to it and, and uh, uh, probably we should have policies in organizations uh, on how uh, the virtual uh, the work from home environment should come in and weigh the pros and cons and try to address the cons and obviously uh, take the uh, pros forward because there are a lot of positive the time that we spend on the road reducers it can be put back to work put back to uh, uh, family uh, and have a proper work-life balance so some of these uh, positives that come out of uh, the, the COVID time has to be used uh, in a positive way to uh, drive economic benefits uh, and and also uh, uh, have the social work-life balance in, in the context so I just wanted to bring that as a closing remark because that's something I think as an organization uh, we are looking at very seriously uh, especially after uh, a lot of uh, challenges in the last nine months. Thank you, Hajita. Ganeshan, yeah. Ganeshan, yeah. Thank you. Uh, just uh, one uh, final thought uh, is that I think the recovery may not come quite as uh, fast as possible. I, I think, you know, Mohammed and I have been talking about this bathtub shaped you, and I think we really need to keep that in mind. Um, and because of that, you know, poverty is going to rise significantly in Sri Lanka. There's no question in unemployment. And I think we need to really keep that social dimension in mind um, as we, you know, as uh, business and government plans for things. And if we don't carry a large segment of the population uh, through providing good social protection, but also opportunities in agriculture where bulk of our poor also live, uh, we will run into some trouble. And that uh, makes the last point is that we've really got to have this coherent strategy which somehow balances a pro-business approach while having a pro-poor approach and, and a pro-green approach as, as you have mentioned. And I think it's going to be much more complicated than what we've ever done before. Um, and I, I think we really need to uh, you know, appoint a set of people who will do this very seriously uh, if we're going to come out of this. I, I don't think the current approach, which is, appears to be somewhat piecemeal, is going to deliver the results. So that's what I wanted to just say. Thank you. Thank you. Before I hand over to you, uh, uh, rather, let me just may I make just one point about, about uh, Port City and the International Financial Center. Um, if I recall correctly, the empirical evidence suggests that 80% of international financial centers have failed. So it is a pretty tough proposition to get this going and get it going properly. Uh, and if Dubai is perhaps the most comparable uh, operation, I think it's useful to understand that Dubai is much a property play as it is an international financial center. I think the authorities created world-class residential and commercial real estate and world-class living conditions. And then the high-end people from the financial center came and lived and worked there. Uh, so I think, I think if I'm not Mistaken, Mister. I think that is the thinking behind the port city as well, right? We are trying to create this kind of really world-class living conditions, which will attract mm -hmm. people to come and come and live and work that's there. Right. Am, am I right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Rajat, over to you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Indraji. What a rich discussion, and I've learned so much from all of you. And of course, I will not try to summarize any of the <laughs> points made. That would be an impossible task. But uh, Indraji, if I may uh, just make three points that I take as takeaways from this. Uh, one is for Sri Lanka, looking ahead, uh, following from Ganesha's excellent presentation, uh, one has to be strategic, recognizes Sri Lanka's competitive advantage. And there, I essentially see three sub points. One is obviously it has to be niche. Sri Lanka cannot be and must not be everything to everybody. So it has to be niche, whether it's in the financial sector, whether it's in the tourism, where Hiran mentioned about the upper end, whether it's the financial sector, where you take carve out a certain area or in the IT or whichever. So it has to be niche. And number two, focus on quality. Sri Lanka cannot and must not try to compete on quantity. Quality is the, going to be the major selling point for, for Sri Lanka. So when people think of Sri Lanka, and I think here you made a great point about Ceylon versus Sri Lanka. So those of us who know it all doesn't make a difference, but once you mention it, I could see why that would be an important point. So quality rather than quantity, the niche, and a point which I've always made to all countries and certainly the smaller economies is consistency. Uh, I know that foreign investors uh, can cope with a lot of issues. What they cannot cope is inconsistency. So whether you have a strategy which is sort of, you know, uh, uh, focuses on sector A or sector B, a reasonable consistency in terms of time is I think a very important one. So that will be one takeaway that I'll, I'll sort of put on the table. The second is that though today we did not specifically discuss the cross-cutting issues, it was quite obvious for the Q&As that cross-cutting issues are very important. Gender, of course, being one of them. Uh, environment is another one of them, which we discussed. And good governance. Good governance is obviously going to be very key. And I think Mohammed in his intervention was alluding to that. Uh, constraints to business, but also good governance, dispute resolution mechanism, legal systems, and how it's implemented, not the laws. Because as Dishta was saying, that will be a major driving force for the development of the financial sector. So that's point number two. And the third one, which we didn't talk much of, but which uh, Ganesh did certainly uh, allude to, is regional cooperation. I really think, I've believed it for a long time and believe it even more strongly now, that Sri Lanka has a very important strategic locational advantage, but also size advantage. And therefore how Sri Lanka manages this dynamics, India, China, not only in South Asian context, but in the larger Asian context is going to be very important. And I think that those are the three takeaways I would put on the table, uh, Indrajit. And, and again, uh, thanks very much for including me in this panel. This has been a very, very interesting and a very educational session for me. Over to you. Thank you. Let me then wind up, if I may. Um, again, um, I too would like just to make three, four points. One is, I think we are all well aware of the, the, the benefit, the advantages, the uh, um, attractions that Sri Lanka uh, possesses in terms of location, in terms of its people, and in terms of its natural endowment. So we really need to find better ways of taking advantage of those advantage of those uh, uh, assets that we have and how do we leverage them to the greatest extent possible that is one two is i think ganesh made a very important point i think sri lanka as every other country in the world is going to experience increased poverty increased unemployment increased inequality and it will be very important to factor that into the mainstream of our policy making. And that, as I said, is not only Sri Lanka, every country in the world is going to face this. So we need to deal with it. Uh, the third point I'd like to make is, you know, uh, Einstein's definition of insanity is to do the same thing again, again and again, and to expect different outcomes. So on, in terms of our macroeconomic policy, we can't keep making the same mistakes again and again and again. You know, it is not, the outcome is not going to be different. 
So that is something we need to sort out. So macroeconomic stress should not continue to be the main constraint as far as holding Sri Lanka back. It's going to be very difficult for companies to, to transform, for sectors to transform, if we continue to have macroeconomic stress. And the final thing is structural reforms are difficult. In Sri Lanka, a toxic combination of populist politics and an, an entrenched entitlement culture amongst the people have had kind of negative feedback loops. They have kind of mutually reinforced each other and have made structural reform difficult. We keep kicking the can down the road. And this applies to all governments. I'm not talking about any one government, but we need to do things differently in terms of macro stability, in terms of structural reforms. I hope we have made a start in doing that differently this time, uh, because without that, I don't think we can have meaningful transformation. With that, let me thank all of you. Let me thank our panelists, our excellent panelists. Motion for waking up the <laughs> the time that he has done, as Rajat mentioned. Uh, I'd like to thank Ganeshan for his excellent presentation and insights. So uh, we're very fortunate, very blessed to, and Suresh also for joining us. Thank you, Suresh, uh, for, uh, for taking the time and the trouble uh, to assist us. And I'd like to thank Rajat for sharing his mature wisdom. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for that. And uh, probably above all, we need to thank Amira Amira and, and her team at Pathfinder for putting all this together so efficiently. Thank you all very much and hope you all have a, have a good day. Uh, and uh, I hope very much that soon that I can get vaccinated and be able to come back to Sri Lanka. I've been waiting for that day. Okay, take, take, take care. Take care all of you and you stay safe. Much. Thank you. Bye-bye.